I'm Margaret Preston, president of Power Over Parkinson's, and today, in conjunction with our POP Profile series, we have Dr. Woodford Beach, speech-language pathologist at the VCU Parkinson's and Movement Disorder Center. Dr. Beach, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, uh, delighted to be here to try to uh, talk a little bit about what we do in speech pathology um, in the world of Parkinson's. Yeah, and I'm smiling a little wider since you're right down the street here at VCU Health, um, our close partners with Power for Parkinson's. So um, yeah. it's that much more exciting for us to speak with you. Great. So let's jump right in. I've kind of categorized some of our questions um, based on topic, and I have more general questions to start, and then we'll jump into swallowing more specificities, if that sounds good. That sounds great. So Dr. Beat, share with us how a patient with Parkinson's can identify um, his or her low volume and voice if self-perception really is um, believing the volume of their voice is normal. Well, um, it's, that is a great question. So that if somebody notices that their listeners are constantly asking them to repeat or their listeners are leaning in that when you place an order in a restaurant, the uh, wait staff has to bend over to uh, hear you. Um, those are pretty good indications that your voice probably is soft. And if, if friends and family are complaining of your soft voice, it's probably not that everybody in the world is suddenly hearing impaired. <laughs> uh, those of my generation, your dad's generation, know that um, our parents, uh, thought that the music we listened to was way too loud and we were going to destroy our hearing. Mm -hmm. And it certainly did happen to some people, but not everyone. Right. So that um, uh, I think those probably are the most obvious uh, um, findings that, that you notice. Absolutely. So share with our listeners what programs are in place for a patient to really correct the volume of his or her voice. Well, the... the uh, one that's been around the longest is something that's been, that's called LSVT Loud, mm -hmm. uh, was initiated in the 1990s. Um, LSVT stands for Lee Silverman Voice Treatment. Um, she was the first, or one of the first patients that the researchers used their protocol on. She was a philanthropist and funded the beginnings of LSVT Global, which has become an uh, international organization with uh, clinicians around the world. There have now been three randomized control studies, so good, strong scientific studies, that demonstrate that people who complete the program successfully, in about 80% of cases, maintain their loudness for at least two years, mm -hmm. many for much longer. And we have strategies for those who don't. Now, there's another uh, uh, program uh, called... Um, uh, speak out from the Parkinson's Voice Project um, uh, does not have as much research. Um, it's not as intensive as LSVT Loud. LSVT Loud is uh, uh, four times a week for four weeks. Um, uh, speak out's not as loud, and we don't. We've never had, to the best of my knowledge, a head-to-head -head comparison of the two. Okay. Um, the third possibility is something called a speech vive which is a device that looks like behind the ear, uh, behind, yes, behind the ear hearing aid mm -hmm. that um, uh, produces uh, sort of a, a sound like a, a party. Mm -hmm. um, it is natural for us to raise our voices when we're in the presence of noise. Mm -hmm. And so with the speech five going, presumably you increase your voice loudness. Now, it did not have really strong research. Um, uh, last year, uh, there were a couple of uh, big research projects at Purdue and Columbia, I believe, that are going to actually test it head-to-head -head with LSVT Loud. So we'll, we'll see whether this really is a good option for yeah. everybody or for some people. Yeah. I will point out that there are less intense therapies for people who um, uh, just are not able to... Uh, tolerate the um, uh, intensity of loud. The, sure. they, they may not be quite as effective, though I've had some good success with them. Um, and there are some clinicians who will be able to do LSVT loud and I suspect speak out uh, virtually. Yeah. 
Well, it sounds like there's several options to folks. Um, LSVT, of course, being more of the mainstay 30 plus year program. So I appreciate that outline of resources to folks. Sure. Um, as we take a step back, share with our listeners what actually happens or how does Parkinson's impact the volume of one's voice? Well, the why is is something we don't really have a good answer to, mm -hmm. but the what the, most of the scientific research now suggests that, to use the fancy term, people with Parkinson's have what's called a um, sensory motor integration deficit. Okay. What that means is that what they when they are listening to their own voice, um, it sounds too loud if they are speaking at what everybody else would call a normal loudness. Sure. Hence, they speak more softly. Mm -hmm. um, it's essentially a problem of their internal um, loudness meter uh, being not calibrated right. So it would be like a, a stove that you set on 400 and it only heats up to 350. Okay. So you have to make adjustments. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting in people with Parkinson's is that they don't hear everybody as loud, just themselves. Mm -hmm. But... Um, uh, with this very intense therapy, it's probably it's quite possible to change that habit of having a soft voice to having one that's louder and and more functional. Mm -hmm. um, I'd also uh, uh, say that the problem with soft voice is not a motoric one. It's not um, that your your larynx, your voice box, isn't working right. It's mm -hmm. that you are misperceiving. Um, uh, the loudness of your voice. I see. Almost an un, an inability to calibrate the volume. Kind exactly. Of and, automated process. Sure. And and a great deal of LSVT loud and speak out is trying to get that recalibration so that it becomes automatic and you talk loudly because that's sound or you don't talk loudly. You talk normally because mm -hmm. that sounds normal to you again. Sure, that makes sense. Uh, well, what advice would you give to patients who have undergone intensive programs such as the loud LSVT program, maybe speak up or, or speak out rather? Um, how can patients really have greater outcomes after going going through these intensive programs? So um, mitigating the perception that the fix is temporary, maybe they've done the four week program um, and un unsure of whether the results will stick. Um, how can you ensure the success of more of a long-term success um, with these with these intensive programs? Well, there's two things. First of all, um, you got to do the home program every day. Mm -hmm. And so you got to try to build into your life. And it's terribly hard to do. Yeah. But you got to try to build into your life sometime every day when you're going to be practicing with the exercises that were given to you by your speech pathologist. Mm -hmm. Um uh, that probably is one of the best determiners of how people can maintain their loudness. Mm -hmm. Now, not everybody is able to do that. It's not, uh, 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 I don't want people to feel bad if they just find it hard to incorporate that into their lives. Mm -hmm. And so the other thing that they should do is have regular checkups with their speech pathologist. Um, here at VCU, we use a dental model. Um, I see most of my patients every six months. Mm -hmm. And in most cases, we come in, we do a little bit of testing, we talk a little bit and we say goodbye and I see them in another six months. Mm -hmm. In some cases, if the loudness is starting to drop and I may be able to notice things before even they can notice mm -hmm. um, be, with my instrumentation, um, I will um, perhaps follow up in three months. If we're worried about it or if the patient uh, wants to do something, we'll do a tune-up, which is generally a, a two-week um, a uh, course of therapy uh, four times a week. Mm -hmm. um, some patients just need more than four weeks. Um, uh, unfortunately, between, um, uh, well, primarily with scheduling, given the intensity, I probably don't have four times a week in the fifth week. Yeah. So uh, uh, we unfortunately will will then will stop after four weeks, but we can we can always help. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'd like to touch on something we touched on in the beginning of our conversation regarding hearing loss. So whether it's a result of loud music or just um, aging, 
naturally. Um, I'd like to talk about it in association in conjunction with Parkinson's disease. So of course, we know some folks with Parkinson's disease also have hearing impairments, hearing loss. How do you mitigate that additional factor that hearing loss um, puts into the mix as you navigate Parkinson's and a low voice? So how do you kind of navigate the added factor of hearing loss um, or impaired hearing uh, with a patient? Well, um, uh, we generally use the same strategies that we would otherwise. Um, some people with hearing loss talk more softly. Others talk more loudly. Mm -hmm. And the, the, there's not really any good explanation as to why one pattern or the other occurs. But I would use the uh, all the techniques I can with LSDT loud to help the person, person achieve a good loudness. And then... Um, uh, with lots of motivational um, uh, uh, talking to them, lots of, of stimulation, lots of encouragement, try to con convince their brains, because intellectually they probably get it, right. but uh, convince their brains that indeed this is normal and then have them speak more loudly. Okay, that makes sense. Um, we talk about Parkinson's medication a lot, of course, um, its benefits, but also some of the side effects or um, some of the things that unfortunately happen after taking dopamine replacement therapy for a long time. But is there any impact regarding um, Parkinson's medications on one's voice? Is there any connectivity? Research is very equivocal. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, with um, uh, dopamine replacement therapy, um, it seems to affect the non-speech functions a lot more than speech. Okay. Um, now, I, I should add, although you didn't specifically ask, ask this, that there are certain types of deep brain stimulation in which there can be negative effects on speech. Okay. Um, uh, although I think surgeons have now become sufficiently aware of those risks that they avoid um, those particular techniques mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that speech is not adversely affected. Okay. Thank you for noting DBS. That was a great add in addition to, of course, dopamine replacement therapy. Um, are voice issues considered motor or non-motor? This is, uh, I guess, a million dollar question. Is it a non-motor or motor symptom of PD? Well, uh, a problem with the that whole classification is that when the, what was it, the, the Unified uh, Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale was created, um, the neurologists who did it were really interested in the prime symptoms of um, uh, Parkinson's, so rigidity and tremor and um, um, moving slowly, the bradykinesia. Um, and they weren't really thinking about speech and language. Right. Um, so voice, clearly, if it's a sensory motor problem, is not a motor problem. But slurred speech, if that happens, which can happen in Parkinson's, um, hoarseness probably are more of a motor problem. Um, uh, although uh, there's not going to be too much effect from uh, dopamine replacement therapy okay. and okay. Do other sorts of things. And actually loud may, may help the um, slurring in some instances. Yeah. And it sounds like depending on the route or what exactly is happening, the symptom can almost fall into both categories. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, if you're ready, let's move into swallowing. Um, I know okay. that's a very important topic as it relates to Parkinson's. Um, at a high level, share with your listeners the impact Parkinson's has on swallowing. Well, first of all, as with any um, uh, uh, symptom, Different people are going to exhibit in different ways. Absolutely. Um, some people will have very little problem with swallowing. Others will have profound difficulties with swallowing. Um, now, here there also is a bit of complication because um, there, there can be different causes for swallowing problems in Parkinson's disease. There is um, a a slowing down of much of the GI tract. Mm -hmm. um, so the just as the, the bowels may slow down, giving a person with Parkinson's constipation, and there's some argument that uh, there are some par cases of Parkinson's disease that actually start in the gut and then make their way to the brain. Um, uh, but also the esophagus. 
uh, so the food pipe may slow down. So a person may have what's called esophageal dysmotility. And so the food just doesn't want to pass through quickly. And if you eat too quickly, you may uh, fill up your esophagus and then may start to back up, which is, and it's all very uncomfortable and very unpleasant. Yeah. There's very different sets of management for that than for a person who has trouble in their throat or in their mouth. Um, so in mouth and throat, uh, typically what happens, the, the, the classic pattern is what's called tongue pumping. The uh, tongue does not move with the uh, appropriate degree of strength and range that it would normally. So you don't swallow the whole mouthful of food um, as rapidly as you should. Mm -hmm. And so food gets left behind or food doesn't completely clear the throat. And your throat has, I guess the best way to describe it is a bunch of pleats. Mm -hmm. It's a soft tube. Um, and so there's lots of little pockets naturally in which food can get stuck. Sure. And so if there's food still there, you're going to feel it, which is uncomfortable. Um, it's conceivable that some of it may go down the wrong way when the swallow is complete and you're breathing again. Mm -hmm. uh, you inhale, you may inhale some of the leftover food. Um, uh, there may be problems with timing because the swallow in a young person like yourself um, is going to be very rapid. Uh, you you push the food back with your tongue and it may be half a second or so before it's starting to go into the esophagus. As you get older, that slows down. Um, and if the uh, windpipe has not been appropriately closed off, uh, uh, food might travel down the wrong way. Sure. Well, uh, based on your response that you just provided us as to really the impact Parkinson's has on swallowing, my very elementary guess for the next question is that it falls in both buckets again. But often patients do ask, is swallowing a physical symptom? Is it a physical abnormality that's happening? Or is it a non-motor symptom? Um, so how would you like to respond to that question? Well, it's prim it is a motor symptom. Okay. Certainly, certainly it's it's due to... to um, uh, slower range of motion, the rigidity. Okay. Um, uh, now the the esophagus is is um, mediated by uh, smooth muscle. It's 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 not voluntary. It's not something you can control. Um, so whether we call that motor or non motor, I don't know. Sure, it's out of our control. But it is a muscle that's just mm -hmm. not squeezing well. Okay. Well, as we discussed um, dopamine replacement therapy, how it impacts speech, share with our listeners how standard Parkinson's medications may impact swallowing, if at all. There are some studies that suggest that it may help. Okay. Um, uh, uh, and certainly, um, uh, uh, if it does help, it, it may not help for a long period of time. Um, and so I would urge anybody who notices that they're having swallowing problems, whether or not they're on dopamine replacement therapy yet, um, see a speech pathologist, ideally one who has some experience in Parkinson's. Okay. Well, what are the recommendations to improve swallowing? Um, can patients really perform exercises? Um, of course they can within the clinical space, but what can they bring home and how can they improve it um, at home potentially? Well, I'm going to be... Um, uh, let's see, how shall I put it? I, I'm going to be somewhat uh, uh, un, uh, or indefinite in how I answer that. Okay. Um, there's so many different kinds of swallowing problems that really what you want to do is see a speech pathologist to identify where the problem is. If it's esophageal, there's one set of recommendations that we can give you. If it's in your throat and in your mouth, there would be a different set of recommendations that we would give you based on what the problems were, but also based on what you want um, or how you want to manage the swallowing problem. Okay. Patients have what we call self-autonomy. You have the right ethically to decide what you want to do. And so what I do as a speech pathologist is I try to balance in my recommendations what the patient's wishes are with regard to quality of life, Mm -hmm. So do you want to be able to keep on eating all the things that you currently eat or don't you really care? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, the the uh, patient may be very concerned about safety. Some people are terrified lest they get a pneumonia. 
Other people, say, eh, you know, if it happens, it happens. And there's the necessity of getting adequate nutrition. Sure. So I want to talk to the patient and understand them well enough that I can work with them to come up with a plan that involves the, the uh, ideal way to manage their swelling, which is going to be very individual. It has to be personalized. Yeah, I think that's great. I was going to summarize. It sounds like it's really personalized and tailored to the patient as far as you know, their overall risk management, management, their goals and what um, they're willing to tolerate, which is, well, which exactly. is really great. And, and there are, there are risks, benefits to many of the strategies mm -hmm. that there are certain diet modifications that um, may reduce the frequency of aspiration, but in some instances, increase the risks of pneumonia. Okay. Paradoxically. And so you got uh, a speech pathologist has to war walk through all of those with the patient so they can decide what's best for them. Sure. That makes sense. Well, are there things that folks can do at home behaviorally potentially to change the outcome of their swallowing success? So a few takeaways, for instance, smaller bites, drinking water throughout a meal. What are some quick, some quick takeaways folks can do? Well, um, just to uh, uh, let, let me add in a couple of other points. Of course. One is that if you're coughing, does not mean food's going down the wrong way. Mm -hmm. It may mean that you're, <laughs> if your throat's been irritated by reflux, mm -hmm. um, so acid reflux, mm -hmm. or or by this dysmotility uh, causing food to back up, you may have a very hypersensitive throat. You may cough if things just don't move down as quickly as they should. Um, if material is aspirated into your lungs, the problem isn't the material that's being aspirated, but rather that the bacteria that's on that food that you, that was picked up in your mouth is getting into your lungs. And if you are a person with a compromised immune system, so most people with a chronic disease like Parkinson's have a compromised immune system, uh, there's the potential to contract a uh, bacterial pneumonia, an aspiration. Okay. Pneumonia. Mm -hmm. So one of the best things that you can do is good oral care. You got to see your dentist. You got to do what the hygienist says. You want to beg them to tell you everything that you can do to try to keep your mouth as clean as possible so that there's less bacteria to go down the wrong way. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's, you touched on so many things that I don't think people think superficially when they think about swallowing. So we don't necessarily think about dental care. We don't think about the potential of acid reflux being a driver of swallowing difficulty. So you touched on some things I think people will resonate with people, like kind of some aha moments. Oh, I didn't think about all these other avenues to, to go down as a result of my swallowing difficulties. So that was yeah. great. Well, good. And um, the other thing that I would say is adjust your diet to what's comfortable. Mm -hmm. So if you find that there's something that you have a really hard time eating, pending your senior speech pathologist, try to stay away from it. If it's, sure. you know, uh, I've had patients who've been delighted when they um, uh, have had to, uh, or have, when I've suggested, why don't you not take such and such? And they said, I don't really like that anyway. So <laughs> uh, I'll live with it. I mean, yeah. you are adults. If you want to eat something that's bad uh, uh, for you or problematic for you, that's okay. Yeah, uh, I had a case with somebody who had many, many years ago who had Lou Gehrig's disease. He had had a feeding tube placed and he came into clinic one day and said, I'm really ashamed of what I've done. And he says, well, what have you done? I ate chocolate. And the physician and I looked at each other and we said, so? And he said, but I have the feeding too. And we said, but if chocolate makes you happy, yes. eat it. Yes. You also have to live your life. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's a good takeaway. Well, share with our listeners the connectivity, if any, between speech and swallowing. So are the symptoms connected? If I have a low voice or slurred speech, am I ultimately going to have swallowing issues? Is there any connectivity between those two symptoms? Um, well, yes and no. They're obviously using the same muscles, mm -hmm. uh, but the control is very different. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's not going to be a one-to-one -one correlation. I have patients who have many, many speech symptoms and swallow is just fine, and the opposite can also occur. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, I, I would um, 
suspect that if a person had uh, uh, very severe speech problems, very severe slurring, that I would be more concerned about swallowing than the person whose speech was very, very clear. Sure, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. As we move into um, kind of the general questions, um, as we conclude our interview, I'd really like for you to dispel the misconception that speech, swallowing, et cetera, is really ancillary to Parkinson's care. What what is what is the uh, detriment, or what are the consequences of really ignoring speech and swallowing symptoms? And oh, what yeah. should it really be on the forefront of PD care? That's a great question, mm -hmm. um, and it's not just because I'm a speech pathologist, <laughs> but study after study has shown that this the more quickly you can address speech, the fewer problems you'll have. Mm -hmm. um, Everything that, unless you are a a monk in a monastery that who does not talk, mm -hmm. um, or talks only very rarely, all of us use speech all the time for everything that we do. Just think of what happens during the day. You you uh, uh, receive a phone call. You answer that phone call. Um, when you go out to eat, you place an order. Uh, with with the wait staff, you um, uh are going any sort of social activity that you're engaged in, many athletic activities that you're engaged in, you're talking to people. Speech is something that we do all the time and it is a part of what we do all the time. Um, and so, uh, of course, having difficulty walking is problematic and needs to be addressed, but so will difficulty talking. Um, Think of what really matters to you. Don't think of the, the medical terminology and whatnot, but think down the road. Um, how happy are you going to be if you are um, in a wheelchair and you can't talk? Mm -hmm. You know, what, um, uh, physical therapy obviously is going to do everything to help you stay mobile, but don't you want to be able to keep on talking regardless yeah. of what's going on physically? Yeah. Um, uh, and so I, I um, would urge people to uh, see a speech pathologist who, who has experience in Parkinson's as quickly as possible. Um, there actually are some suggestions that it should be done with uh, after the disease is first diagnosed, just to make a, a connection and have somebody who's going to be able to listen and advise you as to when, if ever, therapy needs to be initiated. Okay. I think that's fantastic. You know, it's to your point, there's going to be physical um, progression with the disease, but if you can kind of take charge of your voice and communication, that just impacts, positively impacts your quality of life in the long run. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our speech is integral to who we are. Mm -hmm. So that when I work with people who have lost the ability to speak, there is not just the frustration that I can't talk to my grandkids or I I can't uh, talk on the telephone or place an order, but there's also a loss of who you are. Mm -hmm. I, and you can minimize that by trying to address uh, the problem before it really becomes a problem. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Beach, how can folks who are listening learn more about your work? And of course, those who are listening right here in Central Virginia, how can they connect with you and the VCU Parkinson's and Movement Disorder Center? Well, um, uh, and I think we have a slide, don't we? Yeah, and we will absolutely put that up. Um, okay. at the end of our well, I'll, I'll talk first. So everything will be in writing no. for folks. Perfect. So um, uh, lsvtglobal.com are the LSVT people. Um, the Parkinson's Voice Project.org will give you lots of information. Um, if you're not aware of uh, Parkinson's.org website and also Parkinson's.org.uk, mm -hmm. um, which has some really interesting information. I've learned over the years that the British um, uh, uh, patient support organizations oftentimes have really good stuff and it's all written in English. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but which is great. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as far as uh, uh, VCU program, if you go to parkinsons.vcu.edu, that will bring you to the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorders Center um, and have information about all of the programs, primarily focused on the docs, of course. Now, if you want to see a speech pathologist um, here at VCU, 
Uh, if you have a VCU doc, just ask them to put an order in and it will go through the system automatically and we will see you. Um, there are two of us here who are trained in loud, uh, both of us at Short Pump, so that there's, which both allows us to see more people, but also it means that if I want to go on vacation, I can because Eric is able to pick up for me. And he, he's a, a great um, young clinician. Patients seem to love him. Mm -hmm. um, now, if your doctor's outside the VCU system, uh, they can fax, and we do have a number on the uh, slide that uh, you'll be able to see. Uh, they should fax the order for um, speech evaluation and treatment or speech and swallowing evaluation and treatment. But we'd also ask that relevant medical records be sent to us from an outside doctor so we have an idea of what's going on sure. and what the management is. Um, uh, if you are interested in LSVT Loud and you're outside of the, the Richmond area or you don't want to come to VCU, just go to lsvtglobal.com and they have a tool to find certified clinicians. Um, I believe that the Parkinson's Voice Project has something upcoming. I looked at it recently and they it it was um, being built. Yes, uh, and but, I, I believe you're right. And I think that they also offer daily um online live zooms as well for folks um, to well uh, and i i should point out that both programs have uh zoom weekly zoom programs mm -hmm. to help you maintain your loudness uh we are hoping this year at uh, vcu to implement um a, a loud for life program uh which would be face-to-face -face, um uh coaching basically it's not going to be okay. speech therapy though it'll be speech therapists running it um, but there are well, there are lots of possibilities yeah. to continue to practice. Yeah. Well, how fortunate is the Parkinson's community now? Is voices really um, and voice resources have really expanded, and they're quite immense. Um, probably, you know, no. a lot more immense and robust than years prior. So, what oh, a absolutely. wonderful thing for you to be able to point folks in an array of directions. Well, thank you. Um, uh, we really want everybody who would benefit from therapy to uh, receive the therapy. And so if you're concerned about your voice, find somebody and talk to them and see what they can do for you. Yeah. Well, Dr. Beach, thank you so much for being with us today. We can't thank you enough for sharing your time and your expertise with our community. Oh, you're very welcome. Delighted to be able to do it. Thank you. Sure.